Welcome. This is the Life Habits podcast series, and my name is Carl Vradenberg. This is the series that helps you to learn new habits in order to optimize your life, in order to stay sane in this crazy world. This is episode 113, and this is the last of a three-part series on career transitions. And I'm delighted to have with me once again for part three of our conversation, we have Renee Albert and Herman Calhoun. What we talked about in part one, we talked about their early lives, where they were born, where they grew up, and also their early experiences in education and the pivots that they went through there as well and the perspectives that they had on, on that, which I thought was really instructive and insightful. And part two, we dug into professional careers and each of Renee and Herman talked about that trajectory that they went through and kind of the lessons they learned from that as well. And we, in this final episode, are going to be talking about their work outside of or the things they're doing outside of work, because I don't want to give the impression that these very busy, very talented, very successful professionals do nothing but work. And they do lots of work outside of their work, and they do things for pleasure. They also do things that I think are really giving back to society. And I would love to share their stories with this as well. So let me again welcome Renee to this particular episode. Thank you, Carl. Nice to see you. And welcome to Herman as well. Thanks, Carl. Great to be back for the trilogy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'd like us to sort of dig into this, maybe starting with you, Renee. And you do a lot at work, but I think you also do a really nice job of balancing your work-life balance. And tell us a little more about what you do outside of work. Sure. Absolutely, Carl. So, you know, it's it's nice to have that time when you shut down the computer and just really kind of get to focus inward and, you know, take some time for myself and for my family. But one of the, one of the main things that I love to do outside of work, one of my biggest passions and, and pursuits is yoga. I started practicing on my own, just kind of as a way to sort of balance out some running and some other, um, you know, physical activities that I was doing. And I just thought it was a really great way to sort of, you know, get more flexible, you know, all the things, um, because, you know, too much running and, and not enough stretching is, is, <laughs> is not good. <laughs> so, so I started to pursue yoga. And then as I got more and more into it, I realized that I really wanted to deepen my practice, just really sort of dive in and get stronger mentally, physically, it just has a number of, of different benefits. So I, as a way to pursue deepening my practice, I decided to go into yoga teacher training. And it was a really enriching experience. It was, oh gosh, I think it was about a nine month journey um, over several weekends where uh, a group of us would get together at the yoga studio and just go through just all of these different trainings and, and practices. So we learned different styles. Uh, we learned um, instruction on not only just how to move our bodies, but also how to work with and help other people uh, move their bodies and learn how to kind of reflect inward as well. So it was just a really great experience for me at the end of the journey. I really felt very different at the end of the journey, I felt a complete energy shift. I realized that there was just some things that I had put priorities on that were different, uh, you know, and just and just kind of had a, a, a sort of awakening at the end of the process. And you know, one of the funny things is, as I as I was going through, my my intention was never to teach yoga. My intention was always just to do this for myself, um, learn some new styles, new new ways of practicing, just you know, new ways for me to, you know, kind of go inward, reflect and, and focus a little bit more on me. But then as I was going through the training, I did realize by the end that, you know, it was just such a gift and just something that I really wanted to to share and work with others on. And so I had started working at a local yoga studio. So as part of the training, you have to connect with a with a with a studio and do some hands-on training. And so 
Um, I have been working with a local studio and um, stayed on as as an instructor. And it was and it's been a really exciting and and really interesting journey being a part of that. What's what's really interesting is that I've found that my mode of teaching, my preferred methods of teaching are very different from the ways I like practice. So when I practice yoga, I'm very into sort of a more kind of high physical strength training type of movements. But when I teach, I really prefer to slow it down. I love yin yoga in just long stretches, you know, very just quieting the mind, quieting the body, and just really focusing in on getting in tune and in touch with yourself and just focusing in on improving that flexibility and resilience that comes from that inner reflection and, and meditation. So that's one of my pursuits outside. I, I also really have a deep love of music. So that's one thing that's been really fun to integrate into um, my teaching and practice, which is, you know, being able to come up with, you know, fun playlists and, and different ways of, of integrating music with practice and movement and working with students in, in that regard. And then another thing that I really, really love to do, and it, it, it is, I will say, my one biggest regret, because I don't do enough of it these days, is I absolutely love to read. I used to read books, I would do like a book a week, I used to just to consume them constantly. And I just love the, you know, the, well, I love all different kinds of books, but you know, just, just that escape that comes with, with, uh, you know, just getting into, you know, just fun, you know, I love like travel fiction and, you know, just period fiction as well. Classics. I love the classics. So it, it's my one biggest regret that I haven't had enough. And I should say, I haven't had enough time. I haven't put enough focus on that. It's, it's up to me to, <laughs> to take the time to, to focus in on that. But it's definitely something that I love to do and is one thing that I look forward to, you know, getting getting back more of <laughs> in my <laughs> in my personal life and in, in my days. So yeah, it's just, you know, it, like I said, it's just a really wonderful way to some different ways to just sort of relax, recharge, refresh, and, you know, kind of rediscover me and, uh, you know, and, and grow in those ways. You know, a lot of the listeners to this podcast series will know my perspective uh, on this. And that is that while I love to read a physical book and in a quiet spot, especially on like a vacation, there are other times that I want to still consume a book, especially nonfiction and as well as even fiction. And I'm a great fan of, of using audiobooks, And that's how I actually now still read, listen to really basically a, a book a week. So when I hear, yeah. I get one and all sort of, so I, I would recommend that. But you mentioned while you were, you were talking that you need to stretch as well as when you're running. Do you still run too? So not so much anymore. So I, I've, I've transitioned more into um, just a lot of walking. <laughs> um, but there was a period where I was really into running. I ran a half marathon. I tried to train a few times for a marathon. And um, sadly, I, I blew out my knee three times. And I, I, yeah. And so it was like the third time I was like, okay, this is a sign. <laughs> this is not going to happen. <laughs> so, so I just kind of dialed it back. And, you know, occasionally I'll do some jogging, but but I've really kind of turned in more into walking, which is also just, you know, kind of in the spirit of yoga. That's also kind of another really nice form of just active meditation, um, just being able to just focus and, and, you know, stroll and get just have that time to stroll and reflect. Also get really great exercise without that, you know, the the, the, the physical, the, the, the extreme the physical. <laughs> yeah, damage. Damn, I was trying to stay away from that. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, I just was like, you know, I, I don't think, uh, I just don't think running is, is quite for me any, anymore, but, uh, but definitely, definitely walking. Love, love to walk, love to hike. I love the, the stuff you do outside of work. So thanks so much for sharing all of that. Let's turn it over to Herman. Same question. Yeah. So I have a, a number of things that I do and I, I, I feel you on the audiobooks. I don't like to read so much, but I love to consume information. And usually my hands are busy, whether I'm making something in the house, whether I'm gardening, uh, you know, planting pots, transplanting things, taking care of the lawn, whatnot. I'll put an audiobook on while I'm doing that. And that, that's how I consume much of my information. And, and there's a number of different topics that I, I listen to, ranging from, say, a podcast about, uh, 
technology and things we do at work, I'm actually pretty interested in what I do. So quantum, science, physics, uh, obviously being an engineer, I still have a passion for that, those, the hard sciences, but all the way de- down to something like I'm, I might listen to consume a podcast for fantasy football <laughs> so, I can, so I can compete well. Uh, the competitive nature of mine is to compete well against my buddies in our in our fantasy football league. And so I, I you know, I spent some time doing that in the week while we get ready for the weekend and we all, uh, you know, jeer each other as as we uh, as we compete in, the, in that virtual league. But that also points back to the fact that I, I think I alluded to this before that I am an athlete. I tend to be maybe not so much an athlete as I used to be, but I, I do play things like basketball. And I've recently, in the last few years, I picked up ultimate frisbee. That's uh, that's something that's kept me active while while when the basketball season has ended during the summer. And I find that you know these sports, like the newer sports, found like I was able to spend more time with my my youngest son. He's 19 now. But when he was around 16, 17, he was more interested in doing things with his dad, right? So Ultimate Frisbee was was one of the things that we would do together. We play we play a team sport we, and, and we play with our colleagues, like our friends and, and sometimes our family that come out and play on a weekly basis. So that's one of the ways that I would, you know, get to relax, give the brain a break, think of other things, but at the same time, staying healthy. I don't like going to the gym. <laughs> I don't have the, uh, the mental fortitude to sit in the gym and do repetitious work. I think I reserve that mental energy for work, but you know, chasing a ball or chasing a frisbee or you know and 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 playing with teammates that's something that i i enjoy doing and just to, when i tone it down to less strenuous activities you know hit up some buddies from grad school and we'll go camping you know it's been an it has been an annual thing that i do with my sons mm-hmm. you know we, we used to go fishing and camp and so we have those memories together of growing up camping teaching them how to light a fire with a single match. I used to be a Boy Scout. So that was one of our challenges. So I, I passed that on to them. And, you know, they they were excited about that and being the challenge of being able to get it going without kerosene or without gasoline um, or any uh, other uh, assistance. Yeah, the single match challenge and, and you know, just uh, catching fish, roasting marshmallows. So it's a good way to wind down and spend a weekend and just do nothing. <laughs> But aside from that, there there are other uh, ways I extend into my extracurricular world. It's one thing I do um, with a, a good friend of mine, Krista Eniojokin. She started a an organization called Active Scholars, and this is for inner city youth where they focus on activities primarily. Um, where they play sports and they learn how to how to participate in sports, but the scholars part is really about engaging with STEM activities and STEM activities, so science, technology, engineering, etc. And so we merged the two, and uh, she started that organization. And I was one of the first people she asked to help actually help out because she knew I was an engineer, she knew I worked at IBM, and she was wondering if I could just come in and give a talk. And I thought to myself, I thought we could do one better because at IBM, we have a, a fairly large volunteer community and this group could have could use a lot of help given that there are a lot of scientific or engineering or developer minds at IBM. And so uh, we developed a, a relationship there uh, and the IBM Volunteer Corps was happy to help and uh, we we started off doing um, teaching electricity to the kids. The snap circuits that was a uh, a tool that we used to use to build circuits, kind of like Lego, kind of like wiring kits. And the kids used to gravitate to that, you know, learning about how electricity works. These would be kids that around grade four to grade six, say. Um, so they're fairly young. They, they don't have all of the the scientific basics yet, but they're excited to learn. And they love to be really active and and participating, working with their hands. I think that's one area where I think I'm able to merge my worlds of sports and being very active athletically and areas of science that I really enjoy. So we pulled those together and, and, you know, five years into the relationship with IBM, we just, we've served thousands of children by this point. And the program's grown so much that we actually have uh, Helen Miters at IBM, who's uh, on the board of directors for Active Scholars now. And she runs that program and helps uh, keep it afloat and uh, engages with IBM on a regular basis. Fascinating. And I was also thinking that you do additional work 
as well, and we have over time, Herman, with regard to HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that. And then Renee, your Accelerate program is a similar focus. So you are also, I think, both giving back to a community is really important to uh, further lift up and, and activate. So Herman, maybe we can just talk a little about that experience as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, give back is a huge part of my life and it's a driving force in a lot of the things that I, I do. In fact, if I just uh, take a step back and talk about during the pandemic with all, where all my team sports went away and I was no longer active, I actually started running and uh, I had a driver though. It, it was it was the incident, the murder of uh, Ahmad Aubrey that got me running and uh, I was I was doing the, uh, the 2.23 I think it's supposed to be 2.23 miles, but I, I did it. I did kilometers. It's a little bit shorter, <laughs> but you know, we, you get the gist of the, it's, it's the meaning of it. It's the intent right uh, behind it. And so in terms of give back HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities are um, near and dear to my heart. We don't have any in, in Canada where I reside in Toronto, Canada, but uh, I do reach out and I, I work with a number of the universities through a program that you in fact started Carl with and uh, so we started off with, with a few schools uh, it was Hampton University and University of the District of Columbia and uh, and Howard University and we've since paired up with an organization called Amy it's advancing minority interest in engineering and they are affiliated with the 14 or 15 engineering I think this is called ABET accredited universities that have programs for certified engineers you can it's a certification for engineering engineering programs and uh, we would hold an annual challenge a design challenge in fact so where we would uh, work with the students from student teams from each of the universities who would participate come up with some sort of problem statement in the world a user-centered problem statement of course mm -hmm. and and uh, figure out a way to apply their technology or a technology to solve a problem that really was a real problem, not not looking for a, a nail, looking for a hammer, right? So it's a problem that they would have to um, vet with people that they thought would be using their system or an existing system or a system that they'd be creating and make, ensure that, that the problem that they were addressing was in fact uh, indeed a, a, a real true problem for their users. And so that design challenge ha happens annually, as I said, and they, they would end up presenting at the uh, Black Engineer of the year awards and uh so that's an annual event that happens in washington dc so all the students and their teams they can they converge on that conference at that conference we have a dedicated day where we would hold the challenge and the students would then compete and present their ideas their problem statements their ideas their user research and uh, then they'd be judged by a, a set of engineers and designers from various companies that were sponsoring the event one other thing that you also did before I turn turn to Renee is a call for code uh, that I think was uh, held at Howard University mm -hmm. and together with the Clinton Foundation, I think. So can you talk a little bit about that and then we'll uh, turn it to Renee. Yeah, that event was very closely related to some of the work that we were doing, especially with racial equity in design. And so for Call for Code, they had a particular intent to, given that we've just come out of this very heavy racial climate, a need to address, you know, diversity, uh, racial justice, all of those related interests and needs uh, with regards to how can we use code to create a better world in those intents? So in those instances, rather. Um, so that was what Call for Code was about. And it had a very large light shone on it because uh, because of who was involved, right? The people who were sponsoring the, the event. And so that that happened, that occurred. I think that's, that's about a four-month event. And, uh, you know, a lot of good work comes out of Call for Code. And I, it follows a, a number of different themes, but our, our theme in particular that year was around uh, meaning different crises such as clean water and a number of other subjects in that matter. Awesome. So Renee, I know that this is partly still at work, but I love that both of you actually lean in on, you know what, here's some things that I really believe in and I really want to contribute to. And I think the Accelerate program is like that. I think also our participation in that same year, uh, there was a lot of focus on the disaster <clears throat> that happened uh, with regard to the um, sort of the, the, the inequities that we see 
And we also had a big conference that was dedicated to the black designer experience uh, as well. So maybe you could just talk about, you know, Accelerate and anything else you want to talk about in terms of the way that you contribute in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Accelerate is one of my personal, like biggest passions. I, I love the program. I love just really everything about it, engaging with the students, um, introducing them to IBM and, and IBM culture and having them see like the breadth and depth of diversity that we have. So just to back up a couple yeah. of steps uh, to talk about ex- Accelerate just generally, um, it is a summer learning program that is designed to help students grow and foster their design skill set, um, their business acumen, their soft skills. Um, again, this is this is geared towards undergraduate participants, but we do um, have a focus on um, recruitment at HBCUs and also a focus on um, recruiting underrepresented minorities into the into the program. So we just re- completed our, our third year. And one of my passions, of course, is look, sitting down and, and kind of designing the experience for the students. So that in, involves the curriculum, um, you know, pulling together our, our instructor team and then our, our, our coaching team. So in regards to the curriculum, we have been completely and just utterly blessed uh, the past couple of years to have uh, Dr. Cheryl Miller come in and host our um, inaugural <laughs> opening session for the summer program. And she is just a, such a delight and, and just really frames um, design history and, and her experience and just really does a wonderful um setting of the stage for the students. And then, you know, throughout the program, we teach them about, you know, the importance of putting the user at the center. Uh, We talk about the unintended consequences of design. Um, And then we also take them through the major disciplines uh, of design, as well as introducing them to some emerging and, you know, exciting design specialties that are out there. So uh, this year we we tapped into some some really fun things. We looked at service design, we looked at behavioral design, design for AI, um, strategic foresight. So it was just a really enriching experience for them. And then, as I mentioned, we, we have a slate of, of coaches that also engage with the students, answer their questions, help them learn about, um, you know, our corporate culture, as well as, you know, developing their readiness for internships and and getting them getting them internship ready and so it's an unbelievable experience I I, I really try to make every week a, a lot of fun for the students all of us do we, we take them through lectures and activity hands-on activities as well as um, you know homework uh, and really um, encourage them to engage and connect with our our design community we have one of the most amazing communities of designers just not only just talent, but really just wonderful humans who really are committed and passionate about sharing their experience and really wanting to, you know, work with others and, and, and mentor them along the way. So it's a really wonderful program. We uh, are excited to be doing it again next summer. So, you know, encourage people to keep an eye out for information on how to apply and, and join us. So it's an eight week um, experience that really, really covers a, a gamut of things. Like as mentioned, you know, we cover design skills, we cover professionalism, we cover um, those soft skills. It's about making those important connections with folks and really learning about the craft of design from designers. And in my opinion, the, the best designers. So <laughs> so it's, it's a really wonderful program. So thinking about what both of you have done and the giving back that you give to the, to the community and, and the like as well, what is in it for you? What do you get out of doing that kind of work? Start, starting with, with Renee and then, and then Herman. That's a really great question. I think for me, this has always been something that has driven me just, just giving back, helping others. I come from a family of teachers and I think somewhere along the way in my, in my, either in my nature or my nurture, <laughs> or, or maybe a combination of the, of both, right. That need that desire to put a hand out and help someone along 
has just been instilled in me. It's, it's always been a part of who I am, what I do. Uh, I, I don't, I don't put myself in a box. I don't, that's not how I thrive. I thrive on helping others and, and really looking towards the future and what, you know, and investing in what that future looks like. Right. And for me, that future is, you know, just helping to grow and develop and foster a community of talented, you know, growing and developing a, you know, a group of talented individuals who are also equally invested in giving back as well. Right. I really, I want to instill that in others uh, and, and help seeing the value in, in creating a community of of sharing, of giving back and, and perpetuating that cycle. And, and that's really important. Maybe that's not the best answer in the world, but it's just always been something that's just been instilled in my heart and just something that I've just always felt passionate and driven to do wherever I've been in whatever role I have been in any ways that I can help and teach and help others grow and learn. I'm I've been there for that. And we appreciate that you do do that <laughs> and, and the like as well. So same question to you, Herman. Yeah. And um, if I were to use the words community, ecosystem, those are those are areas I think in which growing up that, you know, that's what I had around me to thrive. I found that the times I didn't have community when I didn't have an ecosystem around me, it was, it was a little bit more difficult to to grow as a person. And so I believe in paying it forward. So what do I mean by ecosystem or community? For example, I think I mentioned I was a Boy Scout. That's where I learned how to camp right now. So, but really out of that came camaraderie and uh, learning to work with others, team sports. That's, that's one of the things I like to do. So in fact, once I had gone through my phase of being a player, I, I would coach. You know, so give back is a cycle. Always pay it forward. You know, it's those that remember those that helped you come up and helped you come out of wherever you you might have been. And especially with my family coming from Jamaica, where, you know, it's a community, it's com very heavily community based there, but it's pretty much a third world country in a lot of respects. So in order to come to Canada and kind of get out of that, that cycle of what one might call poverty. It required people to help. And so if you didn't have those helping hands along the way, you kind of get stuck, right? And it's, it's you see it in our family, in the family unit, of course, this is what parents do for their children, right? And ensure that they, they have shoulders to stand on. And so there are those people out in the community and in your ecosystem that help you progress along the way. And, and that's why I do it because we all need each other and we're all part of the same kingdom in the world, right? So in order to make this place a better place, we've got to work together. And so that's that's essentially what drives me. It's, it's been what's made me better. It's been what's given a lot to where I am today. And therefore, I do the same. It's all out of love. So we've heard your fascinating life stories the early period, the, the sort of middle period, the things you do in addition to your work as well. Why don't also just ask, now that somebody's listening to all of your stories and the like, what kind of advice might you be wanting to provide the people listening now that have heard your whole story and the like? If you can gel, what kind of advice you would give to somebody that is sort of anybody, but also you know, people that might be more um, in the uh, sort of the diverse uh, category, uh, you're, you're, you're both, you know, black designers. And if you have any advice there, or even advice with regard to anybody else that uh, with all of your sort of outreach and advocacy, and uh, Herman, I follow you on Instagram. So I see everything that you're doing there. there. What, what kind of advice would you give to people listening that you think would make the world a better place? And we can start with Herman in this case. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a there's a quote. I was I I referred to Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. and she'd said that uh, I've learned that making a living is not the same thing as making a life. So it's really about enjoying what you do or try to enjoy what you do. That's very important. So you've got one life to live, and we 
we don't live to work. We work so that we can live. <laughs> so do what you can, do what you want, you know, make a zigzag path. You know, a, a lot of us talk about how our paths have become zigzag or they were, they were zigzag and not a direct path to where we needed to be or wanted to be. But we didn't know, always know where we wanted to be. So it's about chasing your interests and embrace discomfort. Get out of that comfort zone. You know, it doesn't have to be one vocation that you have. You could have multiple vocations, but always seek and thrive and change because it's inevitable, right? Change is change will always be here. And so if you can embrace change and find a way to chase your passions, I think that's how you can get the most out of this world. That's great advice. Thanks so much for that. Over to Renee. Yeah. So my my advice really echoes really just basically mirrors what what Herman said, which was, um, and what's funny is that Herman was uh, thinking back and reflecting on his initial opening quote. And I, that's, that was the first thing that, that came to my mind when, when you asked the question, Carl. Um, but, you know, my my quote when I started the podcast adventure uh, trilogy uh, was, you know, be open to change and the world will reward you with opportunity. And so just be open, have courage, be willing to step outside that comfort zone, you know, ask all of the questions because you know you don't know what you don't know what you don't know and there are plenty of people who are out there who are willing to put a hand out and answer those questions and really just having that courage digging deep um i you know i'm i'm tend towards uh, a, a little bit of um you know introversion i'm 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 a quieter uh, soul quiet on the inside but it is important to step outside of of your comfort zones and really just be willing to take risks and open yourself up to those opportunities because if you don't ask you know then what and it took courage for both of you to share your stories. So I think openly and transparently, I really appreciate that. And that was also, you know, a, a matter of taking a risk in terms of sharing all the details of all your, your lives. And listeners actually asked for this series in terms of really understanding in some detail, the kind of life experiences of people that have also in particular, like you said, Herman, zigzagged or, you know, taken a, a pivoted in their career is the other way I would say it. And a lot of people think that you choose what you're going to choose when you're young and then you go and do that. But I think that Herman, you also uh, explained your experience that early on, you didn't know what was possible and your parents, you know, had a concept of what you needed to be. And it took you a couple of degrees to figure out <laughs> where you, where you really wanted to land. But that wasn't a matter of like leaving the previous uh, discipline discipline behind, you're now basically have the, both disciplines uh, that you can contribute, which is, I think, really, really significant. And Renee, you talked about your early career and, and how our early life in terms of how your parents encouraged lots of exploration and were really encouraging of, of different directions to go. And you played around with different ideas, you know, as well. So I think you're both exuding in sort of reinforcing the notion that you should really try different things and that you have the time uh, that you can go and experience all this, I think you also both also really effectively reinforce the notion that you shouldn't be all work and no play. And some of that play can also be giving back. And I think I, many people know, I do a lot of that work as well. And I, I don't think I could only just do a day job and not actually, you know, give back society to have a notion of where the world should go and do what you can do to advance it as well. And I think it gives us a whole sense of confidence that we can, you know, make a difference. A lot of people look at sort of the state of the world and just give up and say, oh, this is, you know, you can't make a change, but each individual can. And both of you have I know because I've observed you doing it, have made significant changes. So I want to thank you for the sessions that we've had together. And uh, I also want to thank all the listeners to this series uh, as well. I hope you've gotten an insight into two very successful uh, and talented professionals and the ways that they've uh, experienced their life. Of course, their lives aren't op over. <laughs> they've got many more years to, to live and you can follow them uh, as well and track where they're, where they're going as well. So I want to sort of wrap it up there. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for listening and we'll talk to you all later and bye for now.